Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And uh, wherever you are in the world, good afternoon. I think there's no morning now. Everybody's supposed to be um, in the evening. I'm Silburn here from London. And uh, welcome to the late one. It's nine o'clock in the UK time. And um, in the United States of America, where Tracy is, it's 4 p.m. Am I right? Just after four. That, that is so correct. And uh, tonight, I want to keep um, the, the limelight on the recent killing of George Floyd in Minnesota. And one of the reasons why I want to do that is somewhat from the UK to show a level of um, empathy and to show a uh, linking with our brothers and sisters in the United States of America at this time, because this killing has sort of gripped the world. I can say gripped the UK. Everybody's a bit angry. Everybody's really concerned about it. We can see what is happening in America to the point where nobody's even thinking about COVID-19 that someone coined the phrase and said there is another virus apparently and this virus seems to be the aspect and the image of racism okay so what i'm doing tonight is just sharing this sort of concept and also to invite two guests uh one from the united states of america which is tracy Humphreys. tracy Humphreys is a good friend of mine she's uh in the pr business she also has uh she's going to tell you more about herself and what she does very passionate very passionate and I've seen her writings recently about her thoughts about what is happening in America, All right? When I introduce Tracy, she will tell you more about herself. I've also got Stephen Akinsanya from the UK. And of course, one of the reasons why Stephen is a good friend of mine, we talk a lot on discussions in regards to knife crime and the mentor for black boy, but most importantly, he's a criminal barrister. So he's gonna give some sort of perspective as well. I may have also a doctor, Dr. Um, um, David Burton, who has been regular with COVID, he may be coming on later, just to give some sort of perspective as to the, the killing and um, the medical aspect of Mr. George Floyd, who we say may rest in peace and our condolences to his family as well. So without further ado, let me introduce my guest. Tracy, how are you doing? <laughs> I am doing um, better. <laughs> yeah. I'm doing better. Uh, yesterday, last night was a very rough night uh, I even shed a few tears um, as the reality of uh, you know some of the things that we are facing um, yes. in this world uh, what just started to um, you know it really started to overtake me for a few minutes last night so I really yes. had a moment um, but just to share a little bit about me as you were saying my name is Tracy Humphreys I am from New Jersey. Uh, my background is in media. I worked in media for about 10 years, uh, you know, doing production work with, uh, you know, a very large, let's just say a large uh, television uh, corporation. Um, and currently I'm an entrepreneur. I also do work uh, in marriage ministry. Uh, I do workshops among many other things. And so uh, tonight, Silver, and I just wanted to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to come on and share, uh, maybe even partly vent uh, in regards to what has been taking place here in the United States. Uh, the atmosphere in this country overall is very sad. You know, a lot of people are sad, they're angry, they're frustrated. Um, they are, you know, some people even have a very uh, <laughs> revengeful, uh, you know, thought pattern right now. There's some people yeah. that's like, I want something to be done. And if something isn't going to be done, I'm going to take matters in my own yeah. hands. And yeah. so we pray that things don't get escalated as we know that they can possibly, uh, that can possibly be the reality. Uh, but Right now, the atmosphere is just one, if I had to give it one word, is people are angry. And yeah. I'm not just talking about the black community, I'm also talking about the white community as well. Yes. Um, even though this was another, another one of those incidents where it was a white cop murdering a black man, uh, there are many white people um, in our country, in the world, I should say, that does not agree with that. They are not in agreement with it. They're angry about it. They're outraged and they too want justice. So I just wanted to make that very clear up front. Uh, there's a lot of white people that is 
Like they're just so disgusted with what it is that they are seeing. As a matter of fact, I have been reading a few uh, social media posts and there's some people that are saying uh, things like, you know what, I have seen this happen before, but I am at a point where I'm like, enough is enough. Justice must be served. And okay. so, uh, you know, this that, that's basically where we're at right now. Okay, thanks for that opening, um, Tracy. And um, and Stephen, Stephen Akinsanya, um, tell people about yourself and um, your thoughts as to the initial thing which is happening in America being with the killing. Hi, uh, Silva. Well, as you know, um, I practice in the area of criminal law and have done so now for over 20, 25 years now, um, representing young people predominantly charged with uh, very serious offences. But more importantly, um, I've taken uh, an interest in um, social reform, uh, helping the youth uh, understand the criminal justice system and understand it's not a place for them and really to focus on getting them the help that they need to right. fulfill uh, their full potential on a level playing field along with everybody else. Yeah. Um, and uh, as Tracy said, I mean, I have been extremely upset over the last couple of days um, to the point of almost shedding a tear thinking about what happened to Mr. Floyd and, uh, and the brutality of what I saw on my screen. Uh, and this isn't really um, so much an issue about race, of course it is, but it's about um, the sanctity of life and the disregard for life and um, the inhumanity of another human being towards another um, when he clearly was in distress uh, and the audacity to behave in such a way in broad daylight where people were recording and none of his colleagues had the moral fiber to intervene. They just yes. stood there watching a man die, and that hurts. It really I, hurts. And, it, yeah. and, and I have to say that you know America, being the leader of the free world and the home of the the free, land of the brave, uh, I, I'm really really sad because yeah. I was only reflecting the other day when I was doing some reading about the great jurist um, Thurgood Marshall, and he yeah. said back then. Um, I looked up a quote. He said, I wish I could say that racism and prejudice were only distant memories. And we're still having these debates, seeing these things play out on our streets now in, with modern media in the 21st century. And that that's wrong. Yes, yes, yes. Now, you know, I saw the, I was doing a, a series of shows um, yesterday and I saw the videos coming through. We were talking about the whole COVID thing, and um, you know, of course, COVID is a factor. And I did a show right after that show, just to say something because I felt I had to say something. And in the morning, this in the morning, this morning, I did my normal walk because I'm doing this thing called a 21 day challenge, and I felt like I had to say something again about it. And I did a video, and it's near to over a thousand views because I was just sharing my thoughts because I, I felt at one point that. Um, what came very strongly, and it's, a, it's, it's terrible to think like this. I felt like it was like the preservation of an endangered species, which is the black man. I, I felt that so very strongly. And in speaking to Tracy earlier, and Tracy can pick up on this, why should it be a preservation of a race or of, of a man? And, and I can go into this further. And I said, listen, I'm gonna keep the spotlight on this from the UK. A lady even contacted me today to say that, people are talking about this, what platforms can we, and I said, listen, I'm gonna do it tonight if it's by myself. Tracy came on at short notice, you came in at short notice, I may get a doctor at short notice as well to come on, but I wanna keep a spotlight on this. Now, Tracy, tell us now, you have seen these uh, killings for a period of time and it happens, and then it happens, and then hurrah, it happens and it happens again. What's your thought about it? How, how do you see this? ending if there's an ending as you live there you got you got lucian your husband is a good friend of mine he goes out he may get stopped by police and that, and then all of a sudden it just moved from zero to 100. how do you feel about that in the states hmm. well you know silborn um i have to say this uh you know we've been for the last 
what, three months, we've been talking about COVID-19. We've been using the term pandemic. Yeah. Uh, the real pandemic that we've been dealing with for centuries is racism. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I am saying this is because um, I have experienced certain things uh, throughout my lifetime and especially encounters with police. I have a brother, I have a husband, I have a lot of men in my family and the different stories that they have shared and the different experiences that they have had over the years, it, it undoubtedly it's racism. You know, um, it, 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 is a, it is a disease, it is a pandemic, it, yeah. it is a virus, you know? Um, this is what we've been dealing with for so long and people are sick and tired. They're just, you know, some people are numb to what is going on. Some people are outraged. Some people want to go out as you saw in Minnesota last night, uh, the people were in the street. They were, you know, they were angry. And some of them were um, taunting the police, which I truly uh, don't agree with. I don't think violence should get violence because that never solves anything. Um, mm. In terms of if I see any, uh, um, you know, any kind of uh, resolve to this in the near future, the only way that I would even fix my mouth to say yes to a statement like that is if laws and legislation has been changed in terms of accountability for these police officers and what it is that they do when they do things like this, you know, when they murder a guy in the process, you know, if you apprehend someone and you have the person handcuffed and the person is on the ground and they are obedient to what you're telling them to do, if you are handcuffed, laying face down, you are not a threat to anyone, right? Mm -hmm. But they always seem to take it a step further or five steps or 10 steps further, or this, in this case, with Mr. George George Floyd, they took yeah. it nine steps further where he knelt in his throat for nine minutes. And while this man suffocated and begged for his life and even cried for his mother, was begging mm -hmm. for water. I mean, my God, that is evil on every level. That is, he didn't see this man as a human being. He saw him as, as an animal that's to be apprehended. You know, he saw him, he didn't see a human being. And so psychologically, I think that some of these police officers who do things like this, these are, these, these are gang bangers. They are, they are, they are, you know, I don't know, we're calling them the Ku Klux Klan, gang bangers. They're, they can't be coming into the force with this kind of mentality. I don't see how they could hire a police officer, another police officer, or mm -hmm. many police officers. Where are they hiring these men from that are doing these things? They come into the force with this mentality. They don't know how to handle power. They don't know how to handle uh, situations that become escalated. I think this is, you know, I have such, I have mm -hmm. so many, excuse me, thoughts about this, I believe that they need to make the process of hiring police officers more stringent. I think they need to go through a more rigorous uh, process in when they come into the force. I think that, they, that their background needs to be checked on. Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. And some water. <laughs> I think their background needs to be checked on. Yeah, now I need water. Yeah. <laughs> Their backgrounds, um, I think they need to be psychologically evaluated in more in depth. Um, I think that the process of becoming a police officer in this country is a little bit too uh, easy. Mm. And so when I looked at other countries and how they vetted police officers, it was totally different from how they do it in the United States. And so yeah. that is something that has been a thought. I mean, you know, Silburn, this is not our first time. This is not our first rodeo talking about things like this, you know? And I say to myself, when are we gonna not have to have these conversations, not have to have these lives, 
not have to um, be venting in our social media posts. Like there has to be something that is dramatically changed in this system. There yeah. needs to be a dramatic change in the system in the United States of America when it comes to police officers. There needs to be more accountability. There needs to be more accountability. I'm going to say it one more time. There needs to be more accountability with these police officers. If one police officer, you know, we were talking about it earlier, uh, Silburn, where we were saying, you know, uh, um, they have this, uh, this, you know, today it's George Floyd. If yeah. you know we talk about it and everything goes back to normal, then in August, whose name will it be? Whose son will it be? Whose husband will it be? Whose brother will it be that we're talking about? And then a month from that and three months from that, and then we go into 2021. And so mm -hmm. what I am saying and what I am, I am believing and I am praying for, and I'm going to be declaring and I'm going to be making phone calls and trying to do my part is that new laws, new legislation, new what, whatever terminology, I mean, you're the lawyer here, Silburn, whatever terminology that is needed for the accountability of police officers that do this. I can assure you that if the, uh, the punishments, if the consequences are, uh, um, if the consequences are stringent, if yeah. the consequences are 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 um, are in a way where these guys are truly held accountable, you will not see crimes like this as much. If their pay is taken away, if it if it hits them in the pocket, see people like this. It doesn't. It what really affects these people is when it hits them in the pocket. Is when it hits their family. Is when jail time is involved. Yes. Then we won't have to have as many of these conversations. I can assure you. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, Tracy. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we just lost Steve a while ago, but he's going to come back. I'm communicating with him at the same time. I want to also invite um, persons who are actually on the side speaking because I want to invite the, uh, my co-host, which is um, the, the, the guest which is not just yourself. I've got a lot of guests here, um, Tracy. <laughs> uh, persons are actually saying, I, I see Sharon saying, he did it because he has the right. Blacks in, Mer in America are still considered three-fifths human. It's enshrined in the statute. Tracy, let's, let's touch on that point there. Um, it's been said many times that um, the constitution is still the same. Nothing has changed, so therefore, it is just time has evolved, but Americans, uh, Black Americans are still considered as three-fifth humans. After slavery, there's not been a level of apology. You know, like in South Africa, they had um, the Constitute and Reconciliation. Uh, has America ever said, has any president ever stand up and say, we are sorry for slavery? Do you know? It had, I'm sorry, repeat that again. Has any American president or leaders say they're sorry for slavery? <laughs> Not that I know of, not that I've ever heard of, uh, because there's some people that thinks th that think that it's it's a part of the Constitution, it's a part of what makes this country. And so uh, I've never heard uh, any uh, president um, or even senator or anyone that actually um, apologize for slavery. Uh, I did hear. The, the governor um, of Minnesota yesterday, I forgot, I'm, uh, uh, please, I apologize, I forgot his name, but he was one of the first politicians um, in terms of a white politician that I've heard uh, say, you know, that we should not have to be uh, fearful as an American, you know, we shouldn't have to be living in fear as Americans, as Black Americans. And so uh, that, that was, really the first time I've heard anything remotely close to any kind of apology. Yeah. And me and Reynolds is actually saying we need to get into the heads of some of these killers with a badge. They are humans. They talk among themselves, divulge in their views, goals like and dislikes to each other. We need to be able to understand what makes them think, what they do with the Black people. Um, 
another person actually said, I believe it is, um, saying that he was, the gentleman was at the forefront of one of Trump's campaign back and forth and they had the, the thing. But, you know, I'm looking at, at something else. And I mentioned it yesterday when I was walking. And when I saw that policeman actually comfortably with his knees in the neck of Mr. George Floyd, he was comfortable. It was so, he had his hand in his pocket as well. So comfortable. And, and I thought about this and how can he be so comfortable? While at the same time, there are traffic going around, people talking to him, and so comfortable. And, and then what it led me to think of, and I transported myself back into slavery, based on the movies, based on the books. And I recall when they say that you will take the black man, the leader, the top guy, the strong man, the head of the family who has been resisting and you take him in front of the town and you actually rape him so that people can see, to say, I am the top dog. And I said it this morning, and I don't know if anybody got offended. And I said, even like with Jamaica, when people sometimes say Jamaica is a homophobic country, I just wanna just leave that for a second and not get into that. One of the reasons why psychologically, I believe things filter down is because of those things in the past. Because it was a sense of saying to the, the crowd, saying it to the world, social media was there. He was being filmed, they knew it. But it's actually sending a message you can't do nothing. Tracy, you can't wow. do nothing. And I saw that very, very, Stephen is coming back in. I saw that very powerful, very, very powerful yesterday. But I, I want to, I don't know if Stephen heard what I just said a while ago. Stephen, I want to get you in before um, they kick you out again. <laughs> um, Stephen, um, What's your take as a lawyer, as a criminal lawyer, a barrister in the UK, if this was a, a case whereby you were representing the family of Mr. Uh, George Floyd, what is your thinking? What are the elements of law which you saw right there, the criminal aspect? Well, certainly from, from what we witnessed, I, I would be pressing uh, the Crown Prosecution Service uh, to thoroughly investigate and press charges uh, in respect of this individual because what he did in my opinion is tantamount to murder um he was an officer uh, operate operating in the course of his duty but he went f over and beyond uh, his duty when he first of all managed to restrain mr floyd legally on the floor handcuffed but then the question is what was the need then to place his knee on the neck of that individual for up to nine minutes. Yes. And this man was pleading for his life. Uh, other people were telling him who were present to restrain himself from kneeling on his neck, yes. to withdraw. His brother officers did nothing. So they could effectively, in my view, uh, just as uh, if the boot was on the other foot, they would have a taste of what it means to be part of a joint enterprise murder yes. because they all stood by and effectively yeah. but by their inaction i would argue encouraged him um and so certainly i'd be asking or certainly pressing the family to ensure that this individual was charged with nothing less than murder mm -hmm. um and of course you know one one would have to tread carefully and there'd be some reluctance to do so but in the light of uh, that evidence that was available via that um, recording uh, I can't see any other charge that would be appropriate in this case police officer or not this man was killed on the streets of Minneapolis there's no other way of putting it and I think many of my colleagues in the legal fraternity would agree with me um, there was an intent there was a clear intention to kill him because one, and I say that because of the length of time that he had him on the floor with his knee in that position. And despite the pleas of that man, he ignored him and he persisted until his lifeless body was then thrown onto the gurney oh, with, yeah. with absolute disregard, sickening. Wow, wow. Uh, Tracy, um, someone said, um, thanks for that, Stephen. I know you're still 
Steven, you're still there, yeah? Yeah, I'm still here. My camera's okay. freezing. Don't worry, don't worry. We're hearing you. And if anything happens, <laughs> uh, Tracy, I'll go back to you. Someone just said, do you think Trump is the current enabler? Uh, I think that question is that because of the, the Trump era, it has increased. What Will Smith said, it has not increased. It's just that the camera is more rolling. Yes. Um, I will definitely agree with the fact that we have social media now. See, all of these things have been taking place for years, many, many years. But now with the, with the advent of social media, uh, you know, people take photos and, and, and uh, video footage and they po they're posting it on social media which just makes the message uh, just become more visible. But these things have been happening for centuries. I mean, um, this, these things are nothing new. Uh, you know, I remember my aunt would tell me about lynchings. You know, they would, uh, you know, um, Billie Holiday sung about, had the song Strange Fruit, right? Mm -hmm. um, and basically it would be, people walking home, the children, um, young people, people, everyone walking home and seeing bodies hanging from trees yeah. at different places. And so these things have been happening, um, but it's just a modern day, it's just another form of a modern day lynching. Um, and this is why I was saying that, you know, uh, we need new laws and we need accountability to, to take place. Um, until these new laws are put in place, we will continue to have these conversations. We will yes. continue to riot. We will continue to be frustrated and angry. The only time that these things shift is when the laws shift, is when someone on here said it. I believe it was Nordia, Nordia McKenzie. She yes. said, how about we start taking a seat at the table Jay-Z took a seat and we vilified him. President Barack Obama took a seat and we tore him down. They mm. can't do it on their own. We as a black race need to start taking a seat at the table. That's the only way all this will stop. When we start being in the Senate, the judiciary, yeah. being commissioner of police mm. and in top positions that will make a difference. Um, when we start voting for people that will stand up for us instead of sitting back and saying we aren't voting. Um, I, I, tend, I, I tend to agree with that. The only challenge is with certain positions, it's not as easy to get in them as, you know, as one, two, three, especially when it comes to the commissioner of the police force. Yeah. And so certain things are not as easy, but we're also not saying that it is impossible. I believe that as we go forth and as we're growing and learning and as we continue to push forth as a people, we need to dig deeper and we need to stop just rioting. I mean, yes, this has rioting work, has yeah. marching work. Yes, it worked back in the day when Martin Luther King and all our other leaders that are, are, are you know, our forefathers who fought for us a certain way. But with, the, with technology, with our new level of intelligence, with our level of education, with more people becoming lawyers, such as yourself, Silburn, such as yourself, uh, uh, Stephen, you know, with more people going into uh, uh, the law, um, you know, realm, going into politics, we need more people that will be able to take a more aggressive stand in terms of changing laws. I can't stress it enough. We need to change the laws so that mm -hmm. when these police officers, these thugs, this Ku Klux Klan that is in the, uh, in the police force do the things that they do, that the punishment will be so severe that it would be a message to others who tries to think that they could come forth and do this to our people and, and hit them in the pocket. I cannot, it, it, it highly incensed me when they first said that these officers were out on administrative paid leave. Why are yeah. they being paid? You know, why were they initially sent off 
with pay. No, you shouldn't get paid. As a matter of fact, there shouldn't have been an, any administrative leave. There should have been, they should have been booked and they should have been in prison. If not all three officers, at least the one that had his knee on the neck of yes. Mr. George, George Floyd, at, at the very least, that would have at least given uh, us civilians some kind of dignity to know that the police off the, the police force that we say should protect us would actually take an appropriate stand. And yeah. so I, I just, you know, Silburn, this just this riles riles me. Yes. Um and uh, and that's correct. And Stephen's gonna come back. And I was looking at some of the comments there on Instagram. Lawila Asia said, it's increasingly extremely shocking to see this sort of thing happening in the 21st century. And um, and with Stephen coming in, Stephen, you were, you were there a while ago when I was speaking yeah. about the, as Trump being an enabling <clears throat> factor. I want to put that bit to you. Do you think that the Trump era has been an enabling factor in this? Yeah, um, I think he has allowed or certainly portrayed um, or made hate made hate um normal he's allowed people to harbor hatred against anything that they see as foreign or different and he's basically given the rubber seal to say it's okay to be like that uh, mm -hmm. i'm your president i'm going to make america great again and by making america great again it encompasses this kind of racism this kind of bigotry and if if the images are to be uh, believed um, the officer in question um, wears the same hat that Trump wore. The only difference was he says he wants to make America white again. Mm. And how can you employ someone like that to protect and serve his community with such views? And I actually agree with Tracy that there needs to be a more stringent, pro stringent process of recruiting law enforcement. Because if you have someone who blatantly on his social media page is harboring such hatred, well, you're basically giving him a license to kill yes. because he is now in a position of power with a gun as law enforcement, and he can take to the streets and literally eradicate as many black men, young black men, as he sees fit. And he will take the view that he's beyond reproach. So that's so, all yeah. been uh, supported, if you like, by a rhetoric from the White House where it's okay to hate. It's okay yeah. to be, be a bigot. And until uh, people get themselves involved, as Nordia says, until people get themselves involved, or more involved, I should say, because you know America has a number of black senators and people in high office, uh, which yeah. is very different from here in the UK. Yeah. Um, but until more people occupy those positions of power where actual change can take place from a legal point of view, we're gonna see this over and over again and we've seen it in recent months mm. we've seen it just recently in georgia yes. people think that they can behave like this and they're beyond reproach and that must stop you, you know what um what you're saying there in regards to the the background and the social media um contents of person because these days now social media is now deemed as a part of a cb isn't it where people check your background and everything so so therefore what you're saying tracy is correct and i, and I have that as part of my discussion on solution as to how can this be fixed? Because being involved in the Senate, being involved as a mayor, like that mayor there who came out and we were vocal, I guess, I don't know if he's gonna be under pressure now from the police hardcore structure, you know what I mean? Because he's now a voice that is cutting in. And I believe very much that this is something which needs to happen in order to actually solve the crux of one of the problems. But, it seems like, and that's why I don't want to even dwell too much on the killings which has been happening, because you and I know, just like how uh, Aubrey died the other day for running, do you notice it sort of died down? The situation sort of died down for a bit? Yeah. And then we came on, yeah. and then we are riled up again. And then if we're not careful, we can be riling up each time. And then eventually what's going to happen is like a buck. You're trying to break a buck if anything. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm seeing persons out there now, and I think Yasmin, someone said it, they're out there demonstrating within a context of COVID, 
which is also dangerous again for people. Mm -hmm. we're, we're, you know, this, this whole situation, Silborn, is so unfortunate, you know, and I wanna just address the COVID situation. I mean, we've all been in quarantine, the whole planet is under quarantine practically. Uh, you know, people have lost family members, they've lost friends, they've lost coworkers. Uh, there's been so much trauma with this whole COVID-19. Not only that, there's now all sorts of speculations about, uh, you know, weird things with police, uh, uh, not police, but hospitals reporting patients that are not COVID. You know, so there's so many things that are that are opening up that people are just exhausted. You know, people have lost their jobs in the United States. Uh, you know, millions of people right now, they don't know what they're gonna do after unemployment, after they're not able to get unemployment. Some people are struggling even being on unemployment. Um, there's so many other things that people are dealing with. You know, it's like everyone is, is in this place of like being an open, vulnerable wound in yeah. the sense of, just so much is coming at us in society, right? And so we're processing this virus. Everyone is trying to keep themselves and their family members safe. And all of these things are already taking place. And then it's this happening. It's like a big gaping, you know, a big barrel of salt that you just pour on an open wound. Yeah. So now people are having to process this on top of everything else. So we have Mr. Aubrey, now we have Mr. George, and who will it be? You know, we pray against it being anyone next, but again, we already know that when you don't deal with situations, it becomes a pattern, right? So when we don't, when we don't confront things, when we don't deal with things, when we don't come up with laws, legislation, when people are not held accountable, all that's yeah. gonna happen is another situation. And and every time they do these things, they up the ante, right? And they become more bold and they become more like, you know, careless. Uh, like yeah. like the gentleman you you uh, shared that, you know, the cop, he was had his knee in Mr. Floyd's neck and he had his hand in his pocket and he had a very smug, I believe the look was very evil on his face. It was very demonic when they uh, zeroed in on him. You know, I was just like, wow, this man has no thought or, or feelings or emotions that his knee is in a, a human being's neck and he is literally killing somebody. Like it, it, it didn't occur to him, right? So these things, um, you know, when society sees that and it's so in your face, it creates a level of trauma in society, a level of anger and a yeah. level of frustration that what else are you going to get from that? But right, more riots, more killing. And then we're going to be, you know, people are in revenge mode. So now they're throwing things at police officers. And this is, and every police officer isn't bad. There are actually good police officers who care. There are good police officers. But unfortunately, when you have repetitive uh, behaviors like this, it has a negative impact on the good guy, right? Yeah. It's just like when one black person does something, they, they put it out on all black people. All of us are like this, right? Yeah. So it's a real challenge, um, Silburn. It, it just, it, it's, it's heart wrenching. Yeah, now I just want to um, pick up on some of the comments on this side. And ladies and gentlemen, I wanna thank you so much for coming on, those on Instagram and those on Facebook as well. Uh, I'd be grateful if you share the video as well, just share it and even create it into a watch party because we're gonna keep the momentum on this one. But in, in some of the comments, um, uh, yes, Yasmin says this put all the black people at risk as they rioted due to coronavirus. The whole thing was staged to kill our dear brothers and move black people. Uh, it was cold blooded murder, totally premeditated. Emil Renazel, where similar acts have taken place, Trump castigated nobody. I think someone also said that 
Fox News said the officer was not at the Trump rally and to be careful, it could be Photoshop. Um, Lorna Foster said the cops are thugs in uniform. They need to have stringent psychological evaluation before entering the force. All are guilty of murder. None had the decency to stop their colleagues from kneeling. That, that's the thing again, um, Stephen and, and Tracy. They never had the decency to stop. They saw what was happening. They, they were aware, but no one of them sort of came out and said, I've seen, I've seen cases where officers stop one of their mates from getting a bit too vocal, but none of them actually did that. Why is that? What, 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 what could have created that thing? That must, you know what? I would say that that's the mentality of that police force. Um, they have a particular mentality and they're working together. Um, that's what I saw because none of them, none of them, I mean, I, you know, if I was in the police force and I saw that, I would have said to my fellow police officer, like, what are you doing? Dude, like, get off of his neck. Like, you're killing the guy. Stop what you're doing. I would have stopped him. But this seems to be a systemic thing where this is training, this is, this is their training, this is their mentality, this is their good old boys club. It's a club, it's a mentality, it's an agreement. So this is something that they've agreed on. That's how I see it. Stephen, um, that cop there, which was standing there, I think he was an Asian looking guy. Uh, he wasn't there touching or anything, he was just backing off the people. But that's what happened with these cops. Somebody's out there, taking people away and he was stopping them, trying to stop them from uh, taking pictures. How would he be complicit in this legally? Would he be part of them being charged for murder as well, even though he didn't come to that? Well, it, well, it may be uh, perhaps a little far-fetched to charge him with murder, but you know, if, as I say, if the boot was on the other foot, you better believe that the prosecution would have a go uh, indicting someone as an accomplice, aiding and abetting uh, um, mm. uh, but on the basis of joint enterprise. And um, clearly his inaction might not make him guilty of murder. But the, the reality is he may be seen to encourage it, his colleague by not doing anything. Um, because it, it just seems unjustified that mm -hmm. where the young man was on, on the ground, um, restrained with handcuffs, uh, the, the crowd were simply filming. They weren't trying to get involved um, in, in, to that extent. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't actually trying to stop uh, some form of public disorder uh, continuing. Yeah. He stood there watching, and mm -hmm. he wasn't the only officer. There were at least uh, three other officers there, and, and I can't understand, uh, officer or not, bro brother officer or not, just on a basic human level where you see something wrong where you see your colleague behaving inappropriately, that you don't call him out, especially in a situation where a man is incapacitated on the floor and he is literally fighting for his life. And you can see it. You can hear it. Mm. Why the inaction? It's, it's unforgivable. And, and, and it's right that they should all have been fired. There must have been a reason for them all being fired because whoever the superior officer is, he must have been disgusted by the fact that there were other officers present who did nothing. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Now, the answers and the way forward, um, actions, demonstration is happening now. Tracy, demonstration, is that effective? No. Because we demonstrated for many others and we're still seeing the same results. So no. Quickly, I'm going to go on to I don't think that. I'm going to go on to Stephen and then come back to you. Stephen, demonstration, what is happening now? Is that effective based on the history? It's effective to the point that you're letting your voice be heard and letting uh, the powers that be know that how angry people are. But moving forward in terms of solutions, demonstrating only takes you so far. And of course, you're taking on the might of the police force who have weaponry uh, and all sorts of uh, other deterrent measures available to them. In looking long term, there has to be a clear strategy amongst community leaders, local government, the mayor, 
the commissioner for police about how you combat uh, rogue officers killing members of the public uh, in this way, it was irregardless, irrespective of whether or not this man had committed a criminal offence. It was a non-violent offence for which he had been apprehended. Why the need to kill him? Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, or on Instagram, on Facebook, demonstration, do you believe it is effective at this time? Because that is what is happening and what, what is forecast is going to be a night of disorder, burning, and maybe more than likely tearing down one's community. We have seen that has happened, and somehow the, the same black community suffers at the same time. There is a possibility of suffering in light of COVID, which is around because of the lack of social distancing when things happen. Tracy, um, let's, 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 okay, so we say the, the demonstration is not effective from your side. What do you believe is effective? In the show. What do I believe is effective? Yeah. Uh, I believe that change making these police officers who specifically apprehend a person, and if the person is not fighting back, if the person is face down, the person has been handcuffed, then if they take any measures after that, and the person dies at the hands of the police officer, I believe that it should be first degree murder. I believe that they should get the full, the fullest extent of the penalty. They should, they should get it. Just the same way that us in the public would, would get that sentence, so should that police officer. There's anger by people. There's frustration by persons. Persons are crying, persons are sad. People are worried about their son going to school. People are worried about their husband coming back home. Mm -hmm. How can that anger, that frustration be translated into something effective? Someone, Sharon um, Bonaparte Hamilton just said, we need to organize systematic financial boycott. Another person said, um, the anger should be targeted. Um, lashing out indiscriminately will not solve this issue. Mm -hmm. You know? How, how, how can these anger, what do you say to people tonight? You're in the States, you're angry, you're annoyed, maybe not angry in the sense of anger. Well, I would say you have more of a holy anger, you know, against injustice. But what, what, what can be done to empathize and to satisfy people I, in the short term? I believe that every person uh, can contact their local Congress, their local uh, commissioner, local politicians, yes. um, contact them, get involved, get mm -hmm. involved. If this is something that is really bothering you, get involved in local organizations, um, put together uh, conversations, put together proposals of uh, things that can be done immediately, uh, submit them to uh, your local politicians, call the Senate, send Trump. I, I don't care, send all of them. You know, just a, 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 a barrage of outreach from the public to the politicians to say, look, this is crazy. I yeah. cannot, uh, uh, you, know, you know, exist in a society where I am feeling, um, you know, anxiety every time my husband or my son or a black male in my family leaves the house that I don't know if they're going to make it back home. This is not a reality that any person wants to live. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the, one of the best things for us to do is yes, uh, you know, and, and just to Stephen's point, I get what he's saying that rioting and marching, your voice is heard, but that can we, I honestly say that that's been very effective. Let's be real here. What is effective is when we all pursue this and don't stop until there is an mm -hmm. outcome. See, if we just vent on this Facebook Live, if everyone talk amongst themselves, if this private organization talk amongst themselves, this wealthy person talk amongst themselves, it's not going anywhere. 
what we have to do, the best way to get our voice to be heard is to write letters, to sit down, to submit letters, to call our local politicians, to go to their office, well, after COVID's over, go to their office and say, look, we need something done for our people. We need to pursue this until we get an outcome. Don't just relax after this, go back to business as usual, but literally pursue an outcome. That's that's where change will be made. Stephen, um, organizing financial boycott, I'm just looking at some comments from persons there. What do you think about organizing financial boycott? How, how effective do you believe that can be uh, as, as a strategy? Well, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure um, in what context that is meant. I know that um, people think that obviously uh, there's a level of boycott that you can mount through um, withdrawing financial support, but as to how that effective that would be, I, I, I don't know. Um, I think the, the better course, uh, and, I, and, and obviously the point I'm making is that I can understand that through people's anger, they will want to go out on, street, on the street and riot, just as they did 30, 40, 50 years ago. But there has to come a point where there is something constructive that is done, uh, which goes to Tracy's point that, you know, we can all vent our anger through social media and our own little groups. But to be effective, one has to get a, become a collective where you are engaging with those who purport to represent you, that there is accountability for those yeah. who are supposed to serve you, i.e. the police officers, that where this kind of behavior happens, that they do feel the full extent of the law, just as a civilian would be um, prosecuted for this kind of offense. Uh, and there needs to be obviously different uh, training methods um, for, for the law enforcement, because I don't understand, even in a country like America, uh, um, and I know that there's a right to bear arms, but why is it that the first instinct is to shoot someone dead rather than incapacitate them? There have been so many cases where people have been shot multiple times, uh, either in the back or in the front. I, I just don't understand the need to do it, even if you're trying to incapacitate someone who may be a threat. But th there just needs to be a collective where people are using their financial power and their intellect and their, their ability to engage with those in the local communities, in government, local government, national, federal, to say enough is enough. If we go back through American history, and Tracy will know it a lot better than me, um, what did Martin Luther King do to, in order to effect change? And okay, we might argue that not a lot has changed, but there were changes made at a point where people were being lynched and those uh, terrible atrocities were happening. And we must yeah. do the same thing today again in our modern 21st century. Well, look, listening to my co-guests on the side here, um, more of a collaboration as a community to ensure voices heard in the corridors of power. Now, when I hear heard in the corridors of power, I'm hearing heard in the corridors of power. And we have always he keep hearing of heard in the corridors of power. But what is needed is after it is heard, there need to be that action. And that is why, um, Sharon uh, mentioned that there's an election which is coming up June the 23rd, bombard our politicians in conjunction with other measures, which is what Tracy is also talking about, whereby there is a need for political participation. Uh, see me, someone said, we've got all these um, black um, senators and everything, but it seems like it is not happening. But I go further. Someone said, okay, you got them in the top excellence, but maybe they need to be in the lower echelons like more black people joining the police force by more people black people more joining the police force they may get the wrath or they may get the kickback effect but you got to have a martyr for the cause isn't it and tracy there must be a pioneer people must be pioneers breaking through you got black police officers but they need to be flooded with more police officers isn't it um are you asking are you asking me silver yeah, yeah, more police officers like in Chicago. Chicago, for argument's sake, black black soldiers killing blacks regularly. It's it's like a normal thing. They yeah, look, it, it really it doesn't matter even if you put more black police officers in the force because you have to remember there's a certain level of training that 
uh, they have to go through. And um, there is a sort of a, an agreement um, with the police force. And so uh, will having more black police officers be more effective? I'm not really sure. See, here's my thing, Silburn. Even if we have better training, even if they put them through a certain process, these things will come up. These situations will come up again. Mm. Now, here is what the deciding factor is for me. And I, I just, I'm just going, you know, I'm a very logic pers logical person. So I'm just going by what I just know off the cuff about life and experience is that when the consequences of something is stringent, people will be more thoughtful. Yes. If you know me having my knee in the neck of this human being and killing him is gonna land me in jail for first degree murder, he's gonna think twice about it. Yes. Because I'm sure he has a family. I'm sure he, he nobody wants to voluntarily go to jail, yes. but he can be smug with his hand in his pocket, sitting there looking at the people with his hand in Mr. George's neck, with his knee in Mr. George's neck, and the other police officers can be chewing the people away, telling them to stop, standing there and watching it because none of them have to deal with stringent consequences of their actions. Yes. Now, when they change those laws and those legislations and you kill a person you who was apprehended, who was not pulling away, who was not being forceful, who was not fighting back, and that person dies in your hands and on your time, and you have to pay for that consequence, believe me when I tell you, we will not be having as many of these conversations. I won't say we won't have any more of them because I can't predict that, but I do believe that the thought process will be a lot different. That's yeah. just my take on it. My honest, <laughs> civilian, heartfelt take on it. Well, what I can see here, um, some of the comments, Floyd Millen, who has recently um, written a book, and I'm open to get him on the show talking about America as well. What he has said is uh, more black officers isn't the answer. Sharon Hamilton Pearson said some black police are more vicious than their white counterparts. Um, Florida, of course, I was going to say, I didn't want to say. Yeah, Florida, of course, said it's a part of the answer, but not the option. And furthermore, there's no evidence of a visible difference of outcome and treatment where large numbers of black officers exist. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Steve, not just missing again, again but ladies and gentlemen, we, we touched the hour mark, which is the end of the show, but this is something, uh, Tracy, we, we'll continue on. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, as I said, I, I want to keep this momentum going from the UK, the UK brothers showing solidarity with America at this time and to show our presence. I, I, I'm planning to have um, I think it's Andrew Crump or whatever his name is. He's a guy who's representing the, the families at present. Um, he's always representing these top cases. I think one of his colleagues, uh, Suan Robinson, hopefully to get her on Saturday and to keep a, a, a presence on this particular topic. And I tell her why I want to keep a presence on this topic is because in the UK, we are not immune from it. Sometimes they say the UK officers see what is happening in America and feel like they can also do the same thing. Officers in, in the UK do not wear uh, guns, um, especially for specialized forces. But um, when America sneezes, the world catches a cold. And what we don't want is the UK to be catching a cold right. in this particular way. So we, we've got to make sure that we're on top of it. And as, as many say, no justice, no peace. Um, you know, <laughs> um, I see Steve Liz coming on uh, as well. Uh, Tracy, what is your, what is your, your last word anyway? In, in this situation? What, what is the message you, if any of your American colleagues are listening? What, what is the You know, Silburn, um, I just, first, first of all, I want to thank you again for uh, pioneering this and just putting, putting a plate, having a space for people to 
share their thoughts and their feelings about this. But I just want to speak into the people's lives. Um, I just want to say that we shouldn't, uh, don't put your, your son or your, your husband or any of your black men on the face of Mr. George Floyd. And here's why I'm saying that we don't want to encourage death. We don't want to embrace premature death. We don't want to embrace crime. We don't want to put their faces on it because the reality is I'm, I'm just asking everyone to pray. You know, we're living in a time where we need to lay hands on all our family members and pray over them every single day. Don't take any day uh, for granted. Uh, pray over your, your loved ones. Pray over the men in your family. Speak life into them. Um, this doesn't have to be their reality. I do believe that although we are kind of venting about this and we're angry about it, God is still sovereign. God is still merciful. God is still graceful. Um, he is a protector. And I do believe in us, uh, you know, praying protection on a daily basis, preventative measures, taking preventative measures through prayer. Prayer does change things. Prayer does protect. Prayer makes a difference. And so I am going to emphasize that uh, wholeheartedly to every person that is listening to this, whether you're listening now or you're listening on the replay, uh, please pray over the men in your family. Speak life into them, edify them, respect them, treat them with the, you know, the highest level of regard. Um, you know, I do believe sometimes even our, our black men are ostracized by society and treated with such impunity at times. And so I believe that we need to also take a stand by just respecting our black men, speaking highly of them, praying over them, praying power, you know, powerful uh, uh, prayers over them. And so that's really my stand. Uh, my heart, my heart goes out to George Floyd's family. Um, may God bless you guys. May God's protection and love surround you all. And I pray that this is not a conversation that we will have anytime soon in the name of Jesus. I pray that we will not have to have this conversation about anybody's son or husband or friend or brother or cousin. So this must stop. And we are going to intercede for them spiritually and make sure that they are covered in the spirit. We just need to lift up black men all over this world. They need to be prayed for. We need to pray for our men. Everybody in the comment section, pray for black men, pray for the black community, pray for our world. We just need more prayer. Yeah. And, and, and ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say that um, uh, Tracy's husband is Lucian Humphreys and uh, we have started a, a movement which is in its embryonic stage, which is called Man Up. It is so funny how that fits in now because it is about men being men and standing up being men, knowing who you are. Uh, Tracy, you have that very early yes. in the morning, isn't it? What time do you guys have it? <clears throat> you, <clears throat> sorry, America time is what time? When when do you guys have the show again? Um, when when uh, it comes on Thursday on Thursdays at. Uh, 7.45 p.m. Eastern yeah. Standard Time. Yeah, 7.45. And funnily, funnily enough, I, I was the one who said, let's do this man up, you know, man up, you know, let's 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 just be men. I don't care what anybody says, just be men. And one other thing we talk about is having a sense of identity of who you are. Once you got a sense of identity of who you are, it makes a big difference. So Lucian, so let's take this further. And he's running with it. Um, so I'm going to have some, of course, linking with him in the, in the UK here. But I believe yes, it's very definitely. It is very important at this time that men stand up and, and man up. You know, people might say it's a bit arrogant, but at this moment, we've got to have confidence in who we are as men. Let us not... I said it, but it's not something that I, I meant in a sense for us to consider as a part of our name or history, the, the preservation of the black man. It shouldn't be the preservation of black man, you know? It should be the rise of the black man and standing up and knowing who you are. And, you know, to be the leader of the house, 
So that's why it's very important that the, the preservation and the protection of the black man is there. And that is so important. So when we see these things happening, let's look a bit deeper at the same time as to the forces which is behind because of the rise of a great nation, Wakanda, mm -hmm. if that's the best way I can say. <laughs> so, I say you know? um, so Lorraine seems some more priors. Brother should come on, perhaps he, he can get... He, Brother should come on, perhaps he can shine a light on this. Okay. Um, thank you. I appreciate the dialogue. My brother is a cop in the States. I hope he will not ever resort to the behavior. Um, Stephen, um, I, I see you're trying to come. I, I, I'll speak for you, Stephen. And Stephen is saying, thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to me. Um, even though I'm in the background there, I can hear you. And I, I want to thank you so much. So I'm speaking on behalf of Stephen. Stephen, I, I, I just spoke on your behalf. I can see that you're trying to get in. But um, it's up to time now, and we need to keep it. Um, yeah. So in, in the next few days, let's follow this page. Please like and share. And we'll be keeping a momentum, keeping the, the spotlight on it from the UK as we empathize and show solidarity with our brothers and sisters in America. Should I say the great America, Tracy? Yes. America will always be great. Okay. It will always be great. There are some great attributes of this country. I'm proud to be an American. Um, I was not, I'm not originally from America. I was born in London. I am a, uh, a Britisher, but uh, you know, I do love the United States of America. There are great opportunities here and there are also great people here. Um, yeah. This is not a country that is filled with uh, all hate. There are some beautiful people here, um, some beautiful aspects of the United States of America. It's still the greatest country in the land. We just have some flaws and some issues that we really need to tweak um, to make it even greater. Yes. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much on Instagram. Thank you much for your time and for being wonderful co-guests tonight. And uh, we'll see you next time and have a good night. May the Lord bless you, may keep you, and may his face shine upon you, you and give you peace. Thank you. Tracy, thank you. Um, Amen. Thank you very much. And I'll log up now and say bye. I don't think there's anything more we can say, Tracy. But you stay there in the background, stay in the green room, Stacey, okay? Tracy, okay? Thanks. <laughs>